Hello and welcome. I'm Nell Payne and I'm here with Richard Curran, the Smithsonian's distinguished scholar and ambassador at large to discuss saving the sounds of history. In some cultures, cultural heritage is less a question of artifacts than of sounds. And in order to preserve that cultural heritage, we must preserve those sounds. Richard, you've chosen two remarkable women to illustrate this concept. Please tell us about them. Well, thank you, Nell. And it's uh, you know an area that people uh, often, as you say, with museums think about objects, but those sounds animate those objects and they tell us the meaning. Uh, and it's through song and tale that we hear first person's account of our history and culture. So Frances Densmore was uh, born in the uh, upper Midwest in Minnesota. She lived near Dakota Indians. And as a young girl, she would hear the Dakota uh, singing and, 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 and drumming. And she'd hear the Dakota language. And she was entranced by that. Uh, and uh, she ended up going to Oberlin College, studying music, but then becoming a real documenter of American Indian song and tale. Now at that time in the late 1800s, sound recording was just being developed. It was Thomas Edison and Alexander Graham Bell racing to figure out who could actually develop a recording machine. So all of a sudden there was a new technology that enabled somebody who was interested in the culture to actually document it and record it. The other thing that was happening at the time that Dunsmore was quite aware of was that what she was doing was not just a hobby, that American Indians were disappearing from the landscape, their culture was being discouraged, American Indians were being assimilated. And so she literally traveled around for decades with her sister, with recording equipment and documenting the song and tale of Native American languages across the country. Uh, and that was a tremendous uh, uh, a feat. And she was then hired as one of the first uh, women anthropologists, you'd call her an ethnomusicologist today, with the famous Smithsonian Bureau of American Ethnology. And this was the unit of the Smithsonian that was really documenting Native American lifeways across the continent. Uh, Frances died in the 1950s, uh, but she left us a legacy of thousands and thousands, thousands of recordings, literally on these wax cylinders. Those wax cylinders that Francis Densmore left us are at the Library of Congress and at the Smithsonian and also uh, uh, published uh, by Smithsonian Folkways Recordings. In the 1980s, the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian really built upon Francis's legacy, Francis Densmore's legacy what they did is they took those old wax cylinders, they transferred them to cassette, they transcribed the recordings, and they sent these cassettes of those old recordings back to various Indian tribes across the United States. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, those people in those tribes, women, men, students, were able to hear their voices of their grandmothers and their grandfathers sing. And it really helped in terms of language revitalization, and it really helped giving uh, a, a great boost uh, to Native cultures as they try to claim uh, their own uh, heritage. Bernice Johnson comes years later. Bernice was, uh, was born in the 1940s in uh, Southwest Georgia, Albany, Georgia. She was the daughter of a uh, preacher she sang in the chorus, she had a marvelous voice. Uh, she went to Albany State College to, to study, later at Spelman. Uh, but in the 1960s, she got very interested and drawn into the civil rights movement. Her heroes were really at Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth and others, because she realized that, that song was a vehicle of um, advocating for your voice in society, your, your rights. And so she became uh, one of the uh, original SNCC freedom singers, uh, started by uh, Cordell Reagan, who she later married. And Bernice went around the country with John Lewis and others and singing those freedom songs. And those are the songs that gave people courage. 
And as Bernice would like to say, you know, she's still with us and she's a close friend. Bernice would say, you know, it was the song that gave people courage singing that before a march in a church when people knew they were going to get hosed down or beaten or sicked upon by dogs. It was singing those songs that gave people courage. So Bernice uh, later came to Washington. She started a group called Sweet Honey in the Rock. Uh, they recorded many albums. They won a few Grammy Awards. They're popular uh, acapella uh, singing groups and brought tremendous attention to the African connection, the African diaspora connection to African-American uh, culture and music uh, that, uh, that many people weren't aware of uh, at the time in the, uh, in the 1970s. Uh, Reagan at the Smithsonian became a curator. Uh, she worked on the Folklife Festival. She worked, brought all sorts of groups uh, from Africa, for, uh, uh, African-American groups from the United States, brought them together. And she ended up curating and starting the first program in Black American culture at the Smithsonian, featuring collections of, of instruments, of songs, engaging in performances, doing exhibitions. And of course, that paved the way for when Spencer Crew became the director of that museum, Lonnie Bunch became the associate director and chief curator of that museum that really injected that sense of African-American culture and history into the Smithsonian. And of course, that had a tremendous legacy in terms of the building of the National Museum of African-American History and Culture today. 